Good morning. Happy Sabbath. If we could all kneel in prayer. Our dear loving Father in heaven, we are just so thankful to you for your many, many blessings and your abundant mercies to us. We thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that you have given us to worship you. And, and right now it's in peace. And we just pray, Father, that you would please be with us through this Sabbath. May your richest blessings be poured out upon us as we worship together. I pray for all of those on the chat, those who are watching on live stream. Please, Father, be with them where they are and bless them today. And, Father, please help me as I uh, present this little message that has come from you. And, and these are your words, not mine. Help me, Father, to uh, make right use of them that others may be edified. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be doing most of my reading from Volume 1 of the Spirit of Prophecy, starting on page 69. But first I want to read what this is going to be mostly about, and it's Genesis 6, Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. So here we see the very beginning of a time prophecy. It's a hundred and twenty years. And in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, she says, More than 100 years before the flood, the Lord sent an angel to faithful Noah to make known to him that he would no longer have mercy upon the corrupt race. But he would not have them ignorant of his design. God does not want us to be ignorant of his design. He would instruct Noah and make him a faithful preacher to warn, warn the world of its coming destruction and we have a coming destruction, that the inhabitants of the earth might be left without excuse. Noah was to preach to the people and also to prepare an ark as God should direct him for the saving of himself and his family. He was not only to preach, but his example in building the ark was to convince all that he believed what he preached. Noah was a living testimony. Noah and his family were not alone in fearing and obeying God, but Noah was the most pious and holy of any upon the earth and was the one whose life God preserved to carry out his will in building the ark and warning the world of its coming doom. Methuselah, the grandfather of Noah, lived until the very year of the flood, and there were others who believed the preaching of Noah and aided him in building the ark, who died before the flood of waters came upon the earth. Noah, by his preaching and example in building the ark, condemned the world. God gave all who chose an opportunity to repent and turn to him. But they believed not the preaching of Noah. They mocked. So here we see a mocking at, during this time. They mocked at his warnings and ridiculed the building of that immense vessel on dry land. Noah's efforts to reform his fellow men did not succeed. But for more than 100 years, he pre persevered in his efforts to turn men to repentance and to God. Every blow struck upon the ark was preaching to the people. Noah directed, he preached, he worked, while the people looked on in amazement and regarded him as a fanatic. God gave Noah the dim exact dimensions of the ark and explicit directions in regard to the construction of it in every particular. In many respects, it was not made like a vessel, but prepared like a house. The foundation, like a boat, which would float upon water. There were no windows in the sides of the ark. It was three stories high. Three angels' messages. 
and the light they received was from a window in the top. The light came from above. This was similar to the temple, that there were no windows in it. Um, the door was in the side. The different apartments prepared for the reception of different animals were so made that the window in the top gave light to all. The ark was made of cypress or gopher wood, which would know nothing of decay for hundreds of years. It was a building of great durability, which no wisdom of man could invent. God was the designer and Noah his master builder. After Noah had done all in his power to make every part of the work correct, it was impossible that it could of itself withstand the violence of the storm, which God in his fierce anger was to bring upon the earth. The work of completing the building was a slow process. Every piece of timber was closely fitted and every seam covered with pitch. All that men could do was done to make the work perfect. Yet, after all, God alone could preserve the building upon the angry heaving billows by his miraculous power. A multitude at first apparently received the warning of Noah, yet did not fully turn to God with true repentance. There was some time given them before the flood was to come in which they were to be placed upon probation, to be proved and tried. They failed to endure the trial. The prevailing degeneracy overcame them, and they finally joined others who were corrupt in deriding and scoffing at faithful Noah. They would not leave off their sins, but continued in polygamy and in the indulgence of their corrupt passions. The period of their probation was drawing near its close. The unbelieving, scoffing inhabitants of the world were to have a special sign of God's divine power. Noah had faithfully followed the instructions God had given to him. The ark was finished exactly as God had directed. He had laid in store immense quantities of food for man and beast. And after this was accomplished, God commanded the faithful Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me. This is the part that's not in Patriarchs and Prophets. Angels were sent to collect from the forest and field the beasts which God had created. Angels went before these animals and they followed two and two, male and female, and clean beasts by seven. These beasts, from the most ferocious down to the most gentle and harmless, peacefully and solemnly marched into the ark. The sky seemed clouded with birds of every description. They came flying to the ark, two and two, male and female, and the clean birds by sevens. The world looked on in wonder, some with fear, but they had become so hardened by rebellion, and the most signal manifestation of God's power had but a momentary influence upon them. This is the most interesting part. For seven days... Seven days... These animals were coming into the ark. And Noah was arranging them in the places prepared for them. So the people not only had the visible representation of the building of the ark, you have animals coming, getting on the ark for seven days. And, and I don't think there's a person in this room that has not heard Jeff say, do you see the animals getting on the ark? This is that time period. As the doomed race beheld the sun shining in its glory and the earth clad in almost its Eden beauty, they drove away their rising fears by boisterous merriment and by their deeds of violence seemed to be encouraging upon themselves the visitation of the already awakened wrath of God. Everything was now ready for the closing of the ark, which could not have been done by Noah from within. An angel is seen by the scoffing multitude descending from heaven. You have an angel descending and closing the door of that ark. He closes that massive outer door and then takes his course upward to heaven again. And it, you have a closed door. And then for seven days, there's no rain.
Seven days were the family of Noah in the ark before the rain began to descend upon the earth. In this time they were arranging for their long stay while the water should be upon the earth. And these were days of blasphemous merriment by the unbelieving multitude. They thought because the prophecy of Noah was not fulfilled immediately after he entered the ark that he was deceived and that it was impossible that the world could be destroyed by a flood. Have we seen that? We didn't see anything happen on November 9th. We didn't see what we, we always want to see something. But there wasn't anything visible except that closed door. Everything had already happened. All the visible representations of what God was going to do had already happened. And once that door is shut, there's nothing else. Notwithstanding the solemn exhibition they had witnessed of God's power, of the unnatural occurrence of the beasts leaving the forest and fields and going into the ark, and the angel of God clothed with brightness and terrible in majesty descending from heaven and closing the door, yet they hardened their hearts and continued to revel and sport over signal manifestations of divine power. But on the eighth day the heavens gathered blackness. The muttering thunders and vivid lightning flashes began to terrify man and beast. The rain descended from the clouds above them. This was something they had never witnessed and their hearts began to faint with fear. The beasts were roving about in the wildest terror and their discordant voices seemed to moan out their own destiny and the fate of man. The storm increased in violence until water seemed to come from heaven like mighty cataracts. The boundaries of rivers broke away and the waters gushed to the valleys. The foundations of the great deep also were broken up. Jets of water would burst up from the earth with indescribable force, throwing massive rocks hundreds of feet into the air, and then they would bury themselves deep in the earth. The people first beheld the destruction of the works of their hands, their splendid buildings, their beautifully arranged gardens and groves where they had placed their idols were destroyed by lightning from heaven. Their ruins were scattered everywhere. They had erected altars in groves and consecrated them to their idols, whereon they offered human sacrifices. These which God detested were torn down in his wrath before them, and they were made to tremble before the power of the living God, the maker of the heavens and the earth, and they were made to know that it was their abominations and horrible idolatrous sacrifices which had called for their destruction. So it, she talks about how the... the the storm increased and, and they tried, the, the people tried to get in. They were blaspheming and cursing God. They were frantic with fear, pleading for admittance into the ark, but it was impossible. God had closed that door and that was the only entrance and shut Noah in and the ungodly out. Only God could open that door. Fear and repentance were too late. They were compelled to know that there was a living God who was mightier than man, whom they deified and blasphemed. They called upon him earnestly, but his ear was not open to their cry. Some in their desperation sought to break into the ark, but that firm-made structure resisted all their efforts. Some clung to the ark until borne away with the furious surging of the waters, or their hold was broken off by rocks and trees that were hurled in every direction. Those who had slighted the warnings of Noah and ridiculed that faithful preacher of righteousness repented too late of their unbelief. The ark was severely rocked and tossed about. The beasts within expressed by their varied noises the wildest terror. Yet amid all the warring of the elements, the surging of the waters, and the hurling about of trees and rocks, the ark rode safely. Angels that excel in strength guided the ark and preserved it from harm. Every moment during that frightful storm, of 40 days and 40 nights, the preservation of the ark was a miracle of almighty power. So here you have forty days and forty nights of rain.
So dropping down anxiously, did Noah and his family watch the decrease of the waters? He desired to go forth upon the earth again. He sent out a raven, which flew back and forth to and from the ark. He did not receive the information he desired, and he sent forth a dove, which, finding no rest, returned to the ark again. In chapter, chapter 7, verse 24 of Genesis, it said, The waters prevailed upon the earth for 150 days. And so here he sent out the dove. He sent the dove out. He sent the dove out twice. So it's there. I just I forgot to write it to make reference to it. So going down a little further, after Noah and his family came off the ark and Noah built the altar, she says, And lest man should be terrified with gathering clouds and falling rains and should be in continual dread, fearing another flood, God graciously encourages the family of Noah by a promise. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a, a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and and the earth, and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. What a condescension on the part of God, with compassion for erring man, to place the beautiful variegated rainbow in the clouds, a token of the covenant of the great God with man. This rainbow was to evidence the fact to all generations that God destroyed the inhabitants of the earth by a flood because of their great wickedness. It was his design that as the children of after generations should see the bow in the cloud and should inquire the reason of this glorious arch that spanned the heavens that their parents could explain to them the destruction of the old world by a flood because the people gave themselves up to all manner of wickedness and that the hands of the Most High had bended the bow and placed it in the clouds as a token that he would never again bring a flood of waters on the earth. This symbol in the clouds was to confirm the belief of all and establish their confidence in God, for it was a token of divine mercy and goodness to man, that although God had been provoked to destroy the earth by the flood, yet his mercy still encompassed the earth. God said when he looked upon the bow in the cloud, he will remember. He would not have us understand that he would ever forget. But he speaks to man in his own language, that man may better understand him. A rainbow is represented in heaven round about the throne, also above the head of Christ, as a symbol of God's mercy encompassing the earth. When man, by his great wickedness, provokes the wrath of God, Christ, man's intercessor, pleads for him and points to the rainbow in the cloud as evidence of God's great mercy and compassion for erring man. Also the rainbow above the throne and above his head, emblematic of the glory and mercy from God resting there for the benefit of repentant man. So I want to go back a little bit. The size of the ark, the length bits, and the height was 30 cubits. Now when I looked it up in the 1828 dictionary, a cubit is 17.4 inches. So 
some people may have a different one, but this was the 1828 dictionary. And so when you multiply it out, it's 5,220 inches. And the height. The breadth of it was 870 inches and the height was 522 inches. And when you multiply, when you divide it, you get 435 feet, 72 and a half feet, and 43 and a half feet. And when you multiply those numbers together, like we like to do here, you get 1,371,881.25. We would call that the volume because it gives you three, you multiply three, you get volume. The square root of this number is 1,171. And I'm going to move this over because there's a lot of numbers that come after this one. Anybody see a familiar number in there? Anybody see a familiar number in this square root? 273. 46. There's one more. 45. 51. So that was kind of like, that's pretty cool. It's, <laughs> I tried doing some of the other numbers, like all of these. I tried adding all of these and seeing if there was anything interesting in that. I really didn't have a lot of time. And so there may be something in there. It was quite a big number when you multiply all those. All of these numbers, when you multiply them, it's, it's a huge number. And so I thought about adding them, and I didn't, I didn't have time for that. So anyway, this... I hope this has been interesting in light of, um, in the notes, you'll see I have some uh, references to uh, the balls of fire. Um, and so when you thought about the works of men's hands being destroyed, their idols being destroyed during the time of this flood, we can see the same thing happening in this fireball. Uh, let's see. Some of these were we've already seen, and I have the reference there in uh, the biographies, volume five, where her grandson said that she was in Nashville when she had this vision. And so, um, one thing that was brought out uh, as I was doing some more research on Nashville that in evangelism, page 29, she said great balls of fire. This would be letter 278-1906. So when, we, when we've looked at it, we've just seen one. But I've always thought there's got to be more than one. And so when you look in the evangelism there for... Uh, 1906, that letter 278, uh, it says balls of fire. So there's more than one. Whether there's more than one on Nashville or whether there's one for Nashville and one for other places, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Maybe, maybe more lights 
probably going to come out on um, those balls of fire. But these also, she says, um, fires were kindled, places were being destroyed. The terror of the people was indescribable. It's the exact same words that she uses uh, in the flood. People were terrified. Their places that they had built for idol worship were destroyed. And so this is the same kind of phraseology that she's using in the flood and in the destruction uh, of these fireballs with the arrows coming out. So this, there's a lot more in there, a whole lot more that I just didn't get a chance to look at, don't have time to address. But this is just a little seed. Hopefully others can uh, look into this and maybe glean out some more things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question or a comment. Sure. Um, this one where it says large balls of fire is not talking necessarily about Nashville. It could be talking about, I mean, we know there's many cities that are going to be hit. Mm -hmm. So I think Nashville might be more specifically a fire ball, mm -hmm. which would be a, a big nuclear explosion. And maybe some of these other cities are going to be hit by you know, smaller ones, or just many, I don't know, that's just a thought. Yeah, I've had the same thought. I, I agree with you. We just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> Shall we kneel for prayer? Father in heaven, we count it a great joy and a privilege to be in your house of worship this morning, gathered with a small group. Pray that your blessing would be upon each one, upon those who could have been here but are not. We thank you for providing abundant testimony of your love and your care for us. And may this day together be a special blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Everybody have a copy of the questions for this morning? Right back here if you don't. We're going to begin a new chapter this morning.
new chapter in the book Acts of the Apostles, beginning on page 70. In light of the title, A Warning Against Hypocrisy, I'd like for us to look at the first question. <clears throat> Def we, I would like to start by defining what hypocrisy means, and we'll go from there. I have looked up some, some thoughts on that if you haven't had a chance to do so. Why don't I go ahead and start? I believe that the best <clears throat> definition for hypocrisy comes from um, a definition of how it affected the Pharisees. And uh, the book, God's Amazing Grace, 106.2, it tells us the hypocrisy of the Pharisees was the product of self-seeking. The glorification of themselves was the object of their lives. Uh, a couple other references I looked at in, in, in thinking about this entire chapter, which is really only six pages, seven pages, the warning about hypocrisy comes from what Bible story in this chapter? The one about Ananias and Sapphira lying about yes. the amount. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira and their, their hypocrisy. They were pretending to be someone that they were not. That's another definition, pretending to be something that you are not. Um, one more thought about hypocrisy. If there's a warning there, it's a warning for you and for me. It goes on to say uh, in another um, reference, 2T 449, that it is a cloak of godliness covering dark deeds. That's another definition of, of hypocrisy. But basically, in a nutshell, I like the way um, God's amazing grace lays it out as self-seeking. That really is the bottom line of it. And so without belaboring that point, I just wanted to, to pause and look there for a moment at that. Um, now let's look at the second part of that question. And it, it, it points out, um, if you look it up, a chapter in the New Testament that has woes issued based on hypocrisy. Does anybody know what that is right off? I mean, we should know that. What's that? 23. Matthew 23. Let's just look there a moment. Matthew 23 has, has anybody ever counted up how many woes there are there? Woes for, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. It's the same in every verse. There are eight Mention eight woes brought to the Pharisees. Um, and it's all based on what we just read from God's amazing grace. It's the product of self-seeking. And, and when does this occur in Christ's ministry? When's chapter 23 occur? It, last visit to the temple. Last visit yeah. to the temple. What other things surround that? Some of the things that precede that, chapter 21. Take a look at chapter 21. What's that? Triumphal entry. Okay. So it's right after the triumphal entry, the, the time of the fourth Passover, just before the, the, the Passover. Okay. The woes on the scribes and Pharisees are pronounced... Um, just before Christ goes to the Mount of Olives in the parable of the ten virgins. So much so much that we could study right there. Okay? Just a, a not important observation. When you say there's eight woes, there's really a seven-one combination because one of those eights, he doesn't call the Pharisee. He says in uh, verse 16, you got to count that one to get eight. It says, woe unto you, you blind guides. Okay. So it creates a 7-1 combination, which is often found in a number 8. It's not 
Aren't the guides the Pharisees? Yes, yes. Okay. But all the other ones, it specifically says. Okay, so this is a different. Okay, it's I just see a what you're saying. Prophetic observation. Very good. That it's a seven-one combination. Yes. Okay. The other ones are word for word, scribes and Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees. Yep. And it's not just guides. What kind of guides is it? Blind. It's blind. blind. It's Laodicean guides. Pretty profound. There's a lot we could study just in that principle. We could stop right there, but let's move on. Um, I think we'll, we'll try to cover down through halfway through 71, and then the paragraph that picks up um, and wraps over to 72, we're going to just put that in next week's Brother Daniel, because it's, where, it's the beginning of the Ananias and Sapphira story. So we're basically just going to spend our time on the one, two, Three first four paragraphs of those two pages. Okay, so you can just pick up in sharp contrast on, on 71. We're just going to leave Ananias and Sapphira out of our study today because there's plenty here in the first few paragraphs. Okay, let's look at question number two. Where did the disciples proclaim the truths of the gospel first? This should be a pretty easy question, a pretty entry-level question. I see an answer right here in the front, Jerusalem. Let's look back in our previous reading to page um, 31. Actually, let's start on 27. Page 27.2. And would somebody like to read that paragraph beginning with before ascending? Some interesting tidbits I would like to pick up here. Ascending to heaven, Christ gave his disciples their commission. He told them that they were to be the executors of the will in which he bequeathed to the world the treasures of eternal life. You have been witnesses of my life of sacrifice in behalf of the world. He said to them, You have seen my labors for Israel, and although my people would not come to me that they might have life, although priests and rulers have done unto me as they listed, although they have rejected me, they shall, still, they shall have still another opportunity accepting the Son of God. Ye have seen that all who come to me confessing their sins I freely receive. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. To you, my disciples, I commit this message of mercy. It is to be given to both Jews and Gentiles, to Israel first, and then to all <coughs> nations, tongues, and peoples. All who believe are to be gathered into one church. Lots in that paragraph. Let's go back to the... A uh, part where it says, My people would not come to me that they might have life, although priests and rulers have done unto me as they listed. And it lists all these situations of people who have rejected Christ. What is offered to those rejectors here? Hmm? Salvation. Salvation, but specifically in the, in the reading here. They still have another opportunity for life. Still another opportunity. And that's what the Great Commission was about there, was providing those groups, priests and rulers and those that rejected, still one more opportunity. And we know Christ was very merciful when we think of how he's dealt with me as a person, as, with you as a person. Think about that. And it puts Christ's forbearance in a in a real personal light. Okay, so that's 27.2. The bottom line of what I wanted to bring from that was he, he was offering another opportunity. Now let's look at 31.2. It just restates, and I will read this um, at the end of the paragraph. Now let's read this whole paragraph starting on 31. It's actually 31.2. Who would like to read that? Christ told his disciples that they were to begin their work at Jerusalem. The city had been the scene of his amazing sacrifice for the human race. There, clad in the garb of humanity, he had walked and talked with men, and few had discerned how near heaven came to earth. There he had been condemned and crucified. In Jerusalem were many who secretly believed Jesus of Nazareth to be the Messiah, and many who had been deceived by priests and rulers. To these the gospel must be proclaimed. They were to be called to repentance. The wonderful truth that through Christ alone could remission of sins be obtained was to be made plain. 
and it was while all Jerusalem was stirred by the thrilling events of the past weeks that the preaching of the disciples would make the deepest impression. Okay, let's, let's look at question number three. D this paragraph really describes the results. Right in there in that paragraph is the, is the key to um, open up the answer to that question. What was the reason that Christ wanted the, the gospel opened up to Jerusalem first? That was, that was uh, spoken on um, page... Um, 27, we read that already. We read it again in this paragraph. And it is mentioned again um, in other places. But those two places for sure. What... What was the result and why? And it's in this paragraph. What happened here? Who was, who was the message for in this paragraph? Before, in, in 27.2, we read about the priests, the rulers, and those who rejected. In this paragraph, we read about a different class. Many. What? Many who secretly believed. Yes. And those who had been deceived. Those who had been deceived and those who secretly believed. To these the gospel must be proclaimed. Now, let's just pause here and think about how does this apply to us today, here and now. Is there, an upper, is there another opportunity? What's, what's being said in here for us? I'm just going to put it real simply like that. Does that say there's another opportunity for those who've rejected? What point are we at on the lines to actually know what's being said to us today? Well, there before 8034. Okay. okay. So if November 9th lined up with 8034, then we're, we're beyond that history. But if it didn't line up with 8034... There's another hand back this way. Well, I won't give a time, but it says that uh, many, if my eyes can fall on many who, who uh, they had been secretly believing Jesus to be uh, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And that these, that these people had been deceived by priests and rulers. And I, I think of the Levites mm -hmm. in connection with this. That's who I think of too. There are, this is telling us that even now there are people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church who secretly believe this message mm -hmm. but have been deceived by the ministers, by the leadership mm -hmm. of the Adventist Church. But one thing that's, that stands out to me in connection with that is something that I've brought out here before. Whenever it's, you know, whenever it says that they secretly believe that Jesus was the Messiah. What, what does that mean whenever we say Jesus is, is a Messiah to us? It means exactly what it says, but it also is, is, has in reference to, as connection with the, that this is the only, I'll just, without trying to quote it, I'll find it real quick here. Uh, that there is none other name given among men, where, where Sister White says, she compares what the apostles said, that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. And she says that just as the disciples said that, so we are to proclaim that there is no salvation in any, in any other message okay. than in this message. That's a good sharpening of what we need to talk about here. Yeah. So we're talking about a message that represents Christ here. Yes. If it's a message that is, represents a man, it's the wrong place, isn't it? It has to be Christ speaking. Yes. It's his message. 
And we have to look at it that way, brothers and sisters. What's that? Is she talking about the three angels' messages? In there? that particular statement mm -hmm. that I was alluding to from early writings 188 to 189, yes, she is speaking of the, of the three angels' messages. But the three angels' messages are very broad. Mm -hmm. And it's and not only that, it is this particular message that, 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 is, that is coming from this place. Yes. That, that's how we need, to, we need to bring it down and not make it broad to say that the three angels' messages because we're, we, we've already passed the first angel, we're already passed the second angel. Okay, so we're looking at it in terms of what, what are different things that we call the third angel's message for now? Latter rain. Latter rain. What else? Loud cry. Loud cry. Fourth angel. Message of the fourth angel, third angel swelling, and the fourth angel joins. Okay. Laodicean message. Is it called that? Welcome to our regular visitors who just came in. The warning. I'm sorry? Straight testimony? I believe so. Yeah. Straight testimony. Mark of the beast. Okay, lots of things that we can refer to this as. So if, if we're talking about this particular concept, did you get the questions for the Sabbath school this morning? There's some over by the door. Somebody see that they get some. There should, should still be some. I just gave them one. They're good. We're trying to, de we're looking at the bottom of page 31, Acts of the Apostles, and we're trying to pinpoint this into a group of people, and we've brought it into the Levites as, as those who have believed but were deceived by the priests and, uh, and the rulers. It's to these the gospel must be proclaimed. Um, there was some place in the study here where I, I, I paused to think about that. I'm just looking to see if it's ahead of us or if it was on this question. Um, let's, let's hold that thought and let's go ahead and develop questions four and five and then we'll come back and try to pull that together with, with these who have secretly believed. That's specifically who... Um, they were to preach to in Jerusalem. Is that correct? Would you agree with that? They were, they were to preach to those who had been, well, we, we saw it on page 27. Okay, the priests and the rulers, they were to have another chance. Those who rejected, they were to have another chance. Then we look at 31, and those who were deceived and those who secretly believed. This message is going to all of these groups of people. Now let's look at Something that pops up in the first paragraph of page 70. Page 70 is the first uh, page of our reading for today. And, okay, it's on the first line, actually. I studied, I, I ran this off, first two pages, and took them with me on an appointment so I could study there. And so I didn't really study right from my book so much this time. I had a separate sheet. But it's right on the first line, as the disciples proclaimed what? The truths of the gospel. And where did they do that? In Jerusalem. I like what it says. God bore witness to their word and multitudes believed. Okay, let's just back up. That sentence is all we're going to take for a little bit. And we're going to look at truths of the gospel. If you had a chance to look at these questions, that takes a prominent role in the middle. And um, the results of the disciples going to Jerusalem first, and let's just go back to, let's just go back to, um, thirty two again, and I want to just say that um, it's actually thirty one point two. It talks about who it was especially meant for. And then it says, and it was while all Jerusalem was stirred by the thrilling events of the past few weeks that this stuff came forward. What were the thrilling events of the past few weeks? Crucifixion of Christ is among them and that's the most important. Wasn't that, or would, I mean, the ascension. The ascension. I don't know exactly. I'm asking. I, I didn't. I thought, what, what a good point. 
That would be another point of study that I did not go into. I thought someone may know. I think it was the, it was the fulfilling of the Great Commission after Christ had ascended. And so, um, but it says that the preaching of the disciples would make the deepest impression at this time. That's an important principle. And so now as we go over to page 70, it says, As the disciples proclaimed the truths, God bore witness and, the, and a multitude believed. So that's the fruit right there. The results, question three, was the multitude believes. Now let's look at the first line of that, that sentence. The truths of the gospel. What does that mean? And let's look up some references that will help us with that. And in fact, let's just stay in this book and go to page 232. Acts of the Apostles 2.32. I looked up truths of the gospel on the CD-ROM to see where it was mentioned and what were the contexts. And this is the first one I came to, uh, 2.32. If you have your book there, your device, I'm going to read paragraph 1, 2.32, paragraph 1. It describes what the truths of the gospel are. We're going to come back and ask another question about that. Wherever the truths of the gospel are proclaimed, those who honestly desire to do right are led to a diligent search of the scriptures. If in the closing scenes of the earth's history, that would be us, those to whom testing truths are proclaimed that would follow the example of the Bereans, searching the scriptures daily, and comparing with God's word the messages brought them, there would be today a large number loyal to the precepts of God's law, where now there are comparatively few. But when unpopular Bible truths are presented, many refuse to make this investigation. Although unable to controvert the plain teachings of Scripture, yet they manifest the utmost reluctance to study the evidences offered. Some assume that even if these doctrines are indeed true, it matters little whether or not they accept the new light, and they cling to pleasing fables with the enemy, which the enemy uses to lead souls astray. Thus their minds are blinded by air, and they become separated from heaven. There's a lot in there about testing truths, but what does she identify those testing truths in other terms? What would be a definition or a repeat and enlarge in that paragraph on the principle of, test, of the truths of the gospel? Say that again. Unpopular Bible truths. That's one, yes. Unpopular Bible truths. What else? Plain teachings of the scriptures. Plain teachings of the scriptures. What else? There's one right at the top of that paragraph. Truths of the gospel. <coughs> Truths of the gospel is what we're looking. That's the phrase we're looking at. That's the phrase we're looking testing at. Testing truths. Testing truths. <coughs> testing truths. What are testing truths? Well, testing truths are unpopular truths. And they're unpopular truths. It's kind of a cycle there. They no, just one. Yes. There's one place where Sister White says that we should have an appetite. For unpopular truth. Okay, an appetite for unpopular truth. That's good. We should have an appetite for testing truth. Yes. We should have an appetite for truths of the gospel. A lot of places she talks about truths of the gospel, but I thought it was most interesting that she equates them there with testing truths. Truths of the gospel are testing truths. What are some of the testing truths for our time? Let's make this a little more practical and for us right here today. 9-11, Islam, November 9th, closed door, <laughs> July 18th. I was say July. Okay, all the way up to July 18th. December 25th. Yeah, there, there are lots, lots of in-between things that <laughs> require greater, some require greater amount of faith than others. And so let's, let's take this to even a more personal level. What's the greatest evidence 
to you personally that we are on the right track. I have to say, just step back a week, what did we say happened last week for sure? Kind of after? Disappointment. A disappointment. It wasn't what, like Sister said this morning in Sabbath school, it wasn't what we expected. So now as we have, have and are in the process of regrouping, what is the greatest evidence for you personally that we're still on the right track? God's leading in our past history and experience. Okay. That's, pretty, that's a pretty profound reason, isn't it? That's the be beholding, the beginning of your confidence, holding it, the beginning of your confidence firm until the end. Okay? Sort of piggy piggybacking on what Jeff just said. Uh, Millerite history being repeated. And, and, and isn't that the bottom line of our reform movement? In the Millerite time period, they were, they were showing the, the, yay, the day for a year and how that was established. And what's established in our time? Repetition of, Repetition of Millerite history. And it, it's, it's, inspiration says what about that? Repeated. It's repeated to the, to the very letter. That's pretty precise. And so, is it a stretch? to look at something in the Millerite history and say, well, that's, that's going to be repeated to the very letter. No. Okay? I, I, would, I agree with everything that's been said. Also, I would also suggest that maybe the special tokens, the little num things about numbers and so forth that's come out, that those are little special tokens okay. that we're told that we are to have. Okay. Okay. What can we say? to people who may be, let's go back to page 27 and think about some of these people who have been um, deceived by the priests and rulers. God's giving them an, another opportunity. Do you think that that could be a stumbling block for some of those people, sister? You said it's a token. Well, God says that okay. we are to have special tokens. Okay. And I would say that these little things about numbers are special tokens. Okay. Anybody else want to add something? I want to get this down to the personal level. Uh, you need a microphone. Somebody want to help her with a microphone? This one right here would be fine. Otherwise, she won't be picked up. That's for the front row seats, is that microphone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would say that the response of Advent Adventism to us is repeated. Okay. Repeated. The, the experience, I, I, I'm trying the to paraphrase. The response of Adventism towards this message and movement. Yes, I was trying to paraphrase it. Thank you. So, we were talking about, could this be a stumbling block for some of these people who believed in Christ as the Messiah and Christ and they're now receiving another opportunity. Do you think that is a stumbling, or could it be a stumbling block, Sister Bronwyn? I think it has to be a stumbling block because we're told that multitudes today are building on foundations that have no, they, it says that they have not been tested, and when the rain falls and the tempest rages and the floods comes, their house fall, and to them which stumble at the word being disobedience, he's a rock of offense. So I think it has to be that way. And that stumbling at the word is, it, again, in Peter, when it talks about the rock, Christ, and, and we're the special rock, we're the priest, the holy priesthood. That same principle comes out there. Go ahead. I think that those that she's talking about are stumbling are not the ones in on page 31 that are secretly believed and... Uh, have right. been deceived by the priest. But that's she's a saying, group of people. what she's saying is there's a group out there that's stumbling, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they're deceived. Uh -huh. it's, it's the same truth, yes. depending on how you relate to it. Yes. You either fall on it and it's broken or it falls on it falls you and crushes on you. you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do we, how do we put those two ideas together that they're bu building on these foundations that haven't been tested and yet at the same time that stone of stumbling is Christ 
How, how do we, do you understand my question? Not entirely. They're, they're stumbling <laughs> on these foundations that haven't been tested, but we're told that the eternal rock, the chief cornerstone, is Christ, so how do we marry up those two ideas? Okay, good question. Does somebody else have a, a thought on how we could bring those two together? The same way we teach our children. The same way we teach our children. <coughs> okay. And Sister Wright says we're supposed to teach our, teach our children line upon line. <clears throat> More than what she says that. I don't get her question. Let's try it from another perspective. Multitudes today are building upon foundations that haven't been tested. That's what they says. That's what it says in Desire of Ages 599. And it goes on, it talks about the eternal rock, the chief cornerstone, Christ, which to them being disobedience is a rock of offense and I'm wondering how they can be building on a false foundation when at the same time it's being represented as Christ. I don't know how those two are going together and we can leave it for later. What's the reference? Desire of Ages 599.4 and 599.5. They have a different Christ. They have a different Christ. And Sister White's it's clear. It's clear. They have different understanding of who God is. It's a misunderstanding of God, mm -hmm. a false foundation. Anything that's not on those four. foundations, right? There's no 599. 599 and 600.1. Yeah. Yeah. I look at that board up yeah. there, and that just confirms that all this is right on. Mm -hmm. They'll look at that board and say it's nonsense. And say it's confusion. Yes. However, if they're amongst that group on page 27 that secretly believed, do you think they're going to understand this sooner? as it's explained to them. And it, the ones that will not understand are the ones that choose not to understand. Yeah, they, they willingly. They're willingly rejected. looking for a reason not, to, not to believe. Accept it. So, yeah. go ahead. In Millerite history, sometimes the mistakes are turn into way marks. Yes. Okay, so God's providentially watching over all this. So we're struggling about people right here and now that have the wrong foundation. I would contend they have the wrong God. And you're raising the question about how we present the gospel to them or, or whatever. And I'm saying when you step back from it, one step backwards, it, the argument between the foundation we have and the foundation that we they have is not about them. It's about the Levites watching a controversy between these two groups of people that helps awaken the Levites to what the issues are. So there's kind of like a third third party, I think. And the third party is who I, I think you are actually speaking about. I believe so. And we're trying to make the third party the that other movement. And I don't think oh, they are. I'm not necessarily thinking no. of the other movement is that party. I'm, I'm thinking of those in Adventism. Yep, that, the yeah. Levites. Yes. That's who I'm specifically speaking of. That's who I'm speaking of, meeting their minds. And, and what we can speak from is our inner source of strength, you know, our abiding presence in Christ. And so what for you is the greatest evidence that you're on the right track when, when a Levite comes to you and says, I, I see this and I see this and I see this, but I'm struggling with this. What is your greatest anchor when you talk to those Levites? You see what I'm asking? What is giving you the anchor point to be in this room today? Okay. This may not answer the question, but I think about this often. You know, we say that the uh, Millerite movement is repeated in our day. Um... Uh, Damstead, I forget his first name. Gerard or Gerard, Gerard I've heard it pronounced Damstead, two different Damstead. ways. In his book, Foundations of mm -hmm. Seventh Evidence, Message and Mission, he brings out, he uses a word that I think is a, a very good word to use in connection with this. He's speaking of the Millerites, and he said, he says that uh, the Millerites, they self-identified themselves with the parable of the ten virgins. They understood that that parable 
was speaking them. to them. Mm -hmm. Not speaking to the human race or the Christianity, Christianity in general. It was, they knew that that was them. Mm -hmm. That to me is very, very important. Uh, pretty much James White echoes that in his book, Life Incidents. And we are to understand that the parable of the ten virgins is us. No doubt about it whatsoever. And the parable of the ten virgins, just getting real basic at an elementary level, the parable of the ten virgins has been an anchor point for me from day one. Yes. And I think most of us could say the same thing. There are other anchor points along the way that have solidified us in who we are and where we are sitting right today. Just on a, on a different level, just like we understand the seventh day evidence that Revelation uh, twelve seventeen is speaking about seventh day evidence. Those who I mean that that's us. That's right. We've known that for years. Yeah. That's an anchor point, isn't it? Revelation ten, mm -hmm. that's us. In the same way, the parable of ten, the parable of ten virgins, that's us. Mm -hmm. Dan Steed says the first thing that the Millerites understood after the great disappointment about who they were, they already knew they were the parable of ten virgins, but was Elijah. Yes. Elijah's an anchor too. Yes. I'll just tell you real, real briefly what is becoming more and more of an anchor. It's always been a positive anchor in Scripture and still is, you know, but it, for me personally, is the story of Abraham and his call to sacrifice his son. Now, that was something that went counterintuitive to everything he'd ever been taught. Patriarchs and Prophets talks about that and opens it up real nicely. But there's one thought I want to leave with you about that. And what does it say about Abraham when he realized that Satan was playing games with his mind? Satan was saying, you can't do this. God has, allowed, has disallowed this, has said it's not to happen. And he knew Satan was tinkering with his mind. So what did he do? Does anybody know? Go back and read the chapter. I'll tell you, he prayed as he had never prayed before. And he hoped that he could connect with, that there would be an angel there, you know, telling him something. But it didn't happen. So he heard the voice of God again. That's the key, my brothers and sisters. He had to know the voice of God. And when God said to do something, he meant it even though it goes entirely against what you know to be true up to that point. I see two hands. We'll start here and then come back there. In that passage, another thing Abraham did is he went back to the places where he knew he'd met God yes. before. Yes. Back to where he last yeah. saw the light. Yeah. That's counsel that we're given. Okay? Good point. Psalm 111, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Abraham, God said of Abraham, I know him that he will command his household after him. Abraham was keeping God's commandments. He was living up to all the light God had given him. And so he understood and knew God's voice because he had been in, in the habit of obeying his voice. He had heard the voice and obeyed it. Yes. yes. And when you look, uh, let's just turn real briefly to Peter. First Peter. I, I have really come to appreciate this passage more and more as time goes on. First Peter chapter 2. And I just, want to, I just want to refer you to verse 3. It's the same principle as what you referred to, Brother Daniel, when you talked about Abraham obeying. If so be ye, that's us, if we have tasted that the Lord is good or gracious, and he's coming to us as a living stone, and then it goes on to talk. But that's the bottom line of this passage. We must have tasted, we must have eaten the message. That's another anchor point, is it not? Is eating that message. 
sweet in our mouth and bitter in our belly, as it was for the Millerites. So much more here that we could talk about, but our time is up. Um, that's why I didn't want to get into Ananias and Sapphira, because there's a lot I wanted to get into. In fact, let me just let me just refer to a couple of those in closing. Question number four. I wrote some references down there of other places in, in Spirit of Prophecy that refer to the truths of the gospel. And let me just refer to a couple of those in closing, and then we'll have our prayer. Um, I had one from God's Amazing Grace, and I'm not putting my eyes on it right now. Okay, here it is. Um, I'm going to cut into this. It's 229.2. You can look it up and get it in its totality later. AG 229.2. The glory of the light, which is the very glory of the character of Christ, is to be manifested in the individual, the Christian, the family, the church, in the ministry of the word, and in every institution established by God's people. This is where... Um, the character of Christ is to be manifested. Now it describes what that is. It says, all of these, the Lord designs, shall be symbols of what can be done for the world. They are to be types of the saving power of the truths of the gospel. They're the last three word, four words are what tie us into the study, truths of the gospel. We are to be types of the saving power. We are to be types or symbols of what the Lord wants to do. Okay? Let me make one comment because we tend to lift Abraham up as this perfect man of faith, but he wasn't. That's correct. Abraham accepted without question the promise of the son, but he did not wait for God to fulfill his own time in his own way. And that delay that was permitted to test his faith, Amen. he failed to endure. Amen. And he was still blessed. Amen. So he failed to endure the first test, right? Isn't that what it's saying? What's the reference there for us? That's Patriarchs and Prophets 145. Yes. But One he that's, still could go on even though he messed up. He messed up and he passed the test the second time. That was the third test. That, that was the third test, yes. He was tested about his wife, too. His wife yes. and about his son, about the promise. Very good. The third test. Last thing you made about how the symbols, my mind went back to, we're supposed to be enzymes, right. we can raise up an enzyme. You know, as we put this truth into practice, yes, we'll become an, an enzyme. Yes, we'll become as an enzyme. We will be an enzyme, not as, we will be an enzyme. Just, there's so much on those, those um, the truths of the gospel. I just hate to close off, but I know we must. So let's kneel in prayer. Father, it's a, truly a privilege to be gathered in your presence as your people, studying your word. And I pray that our time together has been a, a special anchor point for us as we recognize the, the decisive times in which you've called us to live. I pray that we could have that experience even now that we must have to see us through. And I know we must have it now. It's not something we're going to get later, but it's something we must have now. We thank you for your character work in us, and I pray that you would just continue and continue to help us realize you've promised that you will reveal yourself to us when we have been born of the divine spirit. And that's my prayer for my brothers and sisters this morning, to fulfill that promise and each bowed here in thy presence. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen.